Un canapé. Acht Leute. Ein Frage. A House Parliament is a get-together of four to eight people who discuss and answer a European question. Everybody can sign up as a host and invite his own friends to this discussion round. Pulse of Europe will provide all the material that is needed. Home parliaments are not simply a means to stimulate discussion and further interest in European politics. The outcome of these discussions will be passed on to politicians who have committed themselves to the project and are interested to know the opinion of the people on the streets. Home parliaments are a method to enhance civic engagement in processes of political decision making. Pulse of Europe wants to use this method to establish a line of communication between people's living rooms and Brussels. With this project, Pulse of Europe wants to further the expansion and influence of a European civil society. Two thousand and twenty-one will be an important year for Europe, overcoming the Corona crisis, the next steps for the new Green Deal, or how does Europe want to handle in future the social differences within the Union and the conflicts about the rule of law? So what do citizens of this Union want and what do politicians think about these positions? Welcome dear Europeans, we are happy that you are here. We, that are Peter, Jan, and me, Anja, and we will guide you through the webinar tonight. The language of this webinar is English, because as a pan-European webinar, we discuss here with guests and people from different countries. So with the European Home Parliament's Pals of Europe wants to stimulate the dialogue between politics and Europeans. In 2018, we therefore developed the European Home Parliaments together with the researchers of the Institute Democracy International. The idea is simple, four to eight Europeans meet at home at the kitchen table in the garden park or cafe to discuss central European political issues. The discussions follow a clear set of rules, clear questions, and in the end of the debate, a clear vote is required, a bit like in Parliament. Yeah, in autumn 2020, for the third time, our home parliaments have started. 1,200 people from all corners of Europe discussed about the future of solidarity in the Union. They come from 12 countries, from Bulgaria to Portugal and Sweden. And for the first time, they met not only personally, but also in a digital space. 500 Europeans discussed via Zoom and often even across countries. Suddenly we had a very lively European citizens talk. I would like to hand over the floor now to Stefanie Hartung um, from the board of Pulse of Europe for a short moment. Steffi, why are the home parliament so important for Pulse of Europe? Well, good evening and a very warm welcome in the name of all board members of Pulse of Europe to everybody here tonight. The European Home Parliaments are so important, so meaningful for our citizens movement because Pulse of Europe is all about citizens participation. We started off in January 2017 due to the Brexit votum, due to the election of US President Trump shortly thereafter and due to the by then upcoming parliamentary elections in the Netherlands, France and Germany and expected notable gains on the extreme right of the party spectrum. We stood up for the preservation of the European Union as a guarantor of peace and respect for democratic values. We simply wanted and still want to get people active and involved in the future destiny of the EU. Today, the Brexit um, has just become reality and President Trump may be history for now, but a lot of harm has been done in the past couple of years 
not only to the US democracy, but also to a significant number of diplomatic systems right within the European Union. And what does that mean? That it is more important today than ever to get engaged in preserving the many achievements of the EU and to make it resilient for the future. How else might we cope with global challenges such as the corona pandemic or the fight against the climate crisis or social inequality? We at Pulse of Europe strongly believe that all European citizens, as a matter of course, must take part in Brussels' day-to-day -day political events and that the citizens' opinion regularly needs to find its way into the political opinion forming processes there. Long before the European Commission actually announced that there should be a European-wide conference on the future of Europe, Pulse of Europe had started in 2018 to connect exactly via the European Home Parliament, European citizens and political decision makers from Brussels and to arrange for a dialogue on substantial European topics. And as we are all now very excited to enter into the very dialogue of tonight on the future of European solidarity, let me finish off by saying thanks to all of you who care about the European Union and take an active part in developing its future. We trust to see you participating also in future rounds of the European Home Parliament and so support this project to become an indispensable element, not only in the upcoming conference on the future of Europe, but hopefully in Brussels' political daily routines. And as we used to say here, let's be the pulse of Europe. Thanks again and back to Anja. Thank you, Steffi. Yes, we are very happy. The response from citizens and politicians to the home parliaments were tremendous. Commission President Ursula von der Leyen officially supports the home parliaments 30 European politicians from the EP and the German Bundestag agree to take position to the citizens' questions. 20 will comment on the citizens' wishes via video in the coming weeks. You'll find their statements um, from mid-February on our website, Home Parliaments EU. And 10 EP politicians take part in our webinars with citizens. They come from four countries and five parties social democrats, liberals, conservatives, lefts and greens. The greens are our guests today. With 73 seats, they are the fourth strongest party in the EP. I would like to welcome Gwendolyn delbos Corfield from France and Franziska Brandner from Germany. Hello. Hello. Bonsoir. <laughs> Bonsoir. <laughs> Gwendolyn delbos Corfield comes from France but was born in UK. She studied politics, joined the French Greens in 2005 and was a regional councillor for the Rhone Alps region in France. In 2012, she was selected, she was elected, sorry, <laughs> to, <laughs> to the executive committee of the European Greens. Since 2019, she is a member of the EP and vice president of the European Greens. She is a member of the Committee on Constitutional Affairs on a, and on Foreign Interference in All Democratic Processes in the European Union. Welcome, Ms. Delbos Caulfield. Thank you. Ms. Delbos Caulfield, um, Greens from different European countries work together in the EP. In your opinion, what are the biggest differences between French and German Greens, for example? Content-wise, I don't see uh, real differences at all. Um, I, I can I can have little divergences with some French, some of my French Greens colleagues, and not with some of my German colleagues, and and vice versa. Um, I I on a daily basis because of my uh, commitment on on various files, I work with. Uh, Thierry Reinke, Daniel Freund, um, Sergei Lagodinsky, Alexandra Gies, really on a daily basis. So, um, so I don't see in the content a real difference. I think the, the biggest problem um, that we meet, uh, not only with the Germans, but maybe this is where it's the most complicated, is that the French have a political structural functioning that is so different. Um, parliamentary work is is 
I'm very critical, but I would say quasi inexistent in France, to be honest. Um, so this is not a habit the French have. Um, we have learned to exist in a political landscape uh, in a way where we always have to affirm who we are, who we have to, when we have to re resist a lot, and where compromises are often, um, in fact, a way of diluting what we want. So this is the main difference. Germans are very, very used to a parliamentary work, very uh, similar to what we do in European Parliament. And sometimes we will, they will propose compromise when we think it's not a good idea. And on the other hand, they will think that sometimes we, we want to vote against things when they think we should compromise. Mm -hmm. um, this is really the only big difference I see. I don't really see one in content. Uh, there are a few cultural different approaches on um, foreign policies, but it's very, very limited. Okay. But that's a very interesting difference, um, what you were, uh, from which you were talking about. Um, um, so it must be interesting for you to be member of the European Parliament because it's quite a different, seems to be quite a different um, uh, uh, daily work than in France. Yes, um, on my point of view, it's a passionate one because it's exactly how I like to work. And I had learned this, as you said, I was I was in the executive committee of the Greens and this the, the Greens, uh, the European party, they, they we function as the parliament. So I was very used to it. It's more difficult for some of my French colleagues to get used to the work in parliament. So, yes, I love it. Um, on the other hand, it's also true, and I really want to, to say that, it's also true that sometimes the, uh, some of my French colleagues will bring innovative ideas and say, you know, oh, if we had this way to do things, um, we would prove our point and we could make the other groups go on our line. For example, on the agricultural policies, I think the French are very uh, stimulating for all the group. Uh, including the Germans, when they would maybe sometimes want to, to be more in a compromised situation. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Davos Caulfield. We're looking forward um, to the discussion. Francesca Brandner comes from Lerach in the tri border area between Germany, France, and Switzerland in the center of Europe. She studied uh, at the School of International um, and Public Affairs at Columbia University in New York and at Sciences Po in Paris. From 2009 to uh, 2012, she was a member of the European Parliament. Today, she's the spokesman for European policy and parliamentary director of the Green Parliamentary Group in the German Bundestag and a member of the European Affairs Committee. Welcome, Ms. Brandner. Good evening. Good evening. Ms. Brandner, you were also part of the EP some years ago. Um, why did you leave? Don't you miss it? Um, sometimes <laughs> I miss it. It's a wonderful parliament. Uh, I moved uh, to the Bundestag or, you know, I ran for the Bundestag rather because I felt at the moment it was after the financial crisis. You mentioned the years I was there. And my impression was that we need a lot more European voices in the Bundestag. Um, and that the area where I wanted to fight is to get the German policies more European and more understanding of the other European perspectives. Um, and it was the rising of the AFD in Germany. And for me, that was also of much concern where I said, you know, I, I have to defend Europe back home. Uh, and I have to fight for this. And that was really my motivation to, to leave the European Parliament and run for the Bundestag. Okay, very interesting. So should um, every um, European politician maybe take part in the European Parliament for a time to, uh, to get an, an idea of what Europe uh, is, in fact? It certainly has helped me a lot. Um, not just in terms of uh, how it works and how... You know, member states do negotiate with the European Parliament, the role of the Commission, which of course you learn a lot when you work there, but also really to get the perspectives from other member states, uh, because it's so interesting to understand how others do perceive us as Germans. And to just know that our German public debate is never just a German debate, it's always a European one, because all the European media do focus and do report in their home countries what's happening in Germany. And I must admit, I have been, you know, a European by heart from, you know, raising up, but I wasn't aware to the extent that our German debate 
is always a European one because it's always transported in almost any other country. Um, and, you know, that has large impacts on how these societies develop and how what political actors do win there or lose. Um, and last point, which for me, it has been very key in terms of the connections I made and the people I met. I was at the time negotiating the setup of the external action service mm -hmm. together with Roberto Gualtieri, who is now the finance minister of Italy. So, you know, it helps. Okay. Um, did you have more direct contacts with citizens um, in the Brussels bubble than you have now as a member of the German parliament or uh, the other way around? You know, the constituency I had was huge. I had like Baden, Rheinland-Pfalz and Saarland, which is like huge. <laughs> now I have, you know, like Heidelberg and the surroundings. Um, so you can be much more present and you can go to many more events locally. Uh, but it's not that I had less or more exchange. It's just more focalized uh, in sort of where you are. I went to see a lot of citizens, you know, but like in a, fur in a much broader area. So I think for citizens, I was much less present because they would see me maybe once a year. Um, and now they see me many more times, but it's not that I need less citizens um, okay. or more now, but the constituencies as European members of parliament and at the time, the Greens were even smaller. So mm -hmm. we didn't even have a member for each a state in Germany. So, yeah. Okay. So tonight um, you meet at 109 citizens um, uh, and so thank you Mrs. Brandner uh, and let's come to the discussion. Three poli uh, two politicians, uh, uh, 109 citizens, quite a lot, um, but we want no long statements this time but a quick lively dialogue. Um, I will lead through the main voting results of the home parliaments and start the discussion with, with our guests, then we'll open it up to you. Peter, can you explain how it works? Yes, and if you want to ask a question, please write it in the Q&A section that you see at the very bottom of the Zoom window. Just have a look. I will pick out a few and read them for your guests, for our guests to answer. If you would like to ask a question via video, please put the keyword the video question in front of your question. We try to take into account as many questions as possible. But please keep it short and come straight to the question. You have a maximum of half a minute. It's really short, so hurry up. We can only consider questions that fit the topic being discussed. Yeah? There are many things out there that are really interesting, but please focus on the, the topic we are discussing at that moment. So let's try this together. The central theme of the home parliaments was solidarity in Europe. How can we bring more European solidarity on the way? What can it look like in concrete terms? What is realistic? Where are its limits? The home parliaments discussed this under three aspects, economic support in a crisis, European social policy and climate policy. So let's discuss the results. As we have uh, two members of the Green Party here tonight, let's start this time with a third aspect, climate policy. Global warming is increasing rapidly. The maximum target, target of 1.5% plus as fixed in the Paris Climate Agreement is hardly realistic. What should the EU do? Should the EU, in the interest of future generations, primarily focus on environmentally friendly innovation and jobs, we asked? The home parliaments were remarkably non-controversial on this question. On average, participants shows a value of 8.9. Citizens expect fast, decisive measures for more climate protection. Ecological change must come quickly and politics must act consistently so that the costs of the sustainable transformation for Earth, society, economy and democracy are kept as low as possible. 40% of the home parliamentarians want that the EU focus clearly on ecological innovations and jobs. Most of them are convinced that the shift to sustainability would preserve jobs, social systems and EU competitiveness. 
Um, however, one fifth, and this was, was remarkable as well, of all home parliaments would like to see a cautious change. Otherwise, they worry member stage, states with a CO2 intensive industries will be left behind. Call for questions, dear participants. If you have questions concerning this point, please note them now in the Q&A or F&A section uh, on the bottom of the window. So Ms. Delvis Caulfield, 40% of the home parliamentarians want that the EU focus clearly on ecological innovations and jobs. How do you intend to commit the member states and their industry to this? What do you think about it? Well, the, the European Union has tools for this, and um, I, I'd like to say that it has always had tools. I mean, if, if there is one uh, aspect where European Union has been quite effective, it is on environmental coordination, directives, and sometimes even strict rules um, that they applied in all European Union. Um, and I, I, when I started fighting for European values, I would often say that if Europe was very disappointing on social aspect, it was. Uh, more demanding than France was at the time, and that it often helped um, national NGOs or, or, yeah, or, or local people to fight against a project in their area, saying, you know, these are not the European rules, and then they would win uh, in front of court. Um, so these are, there's this, there's these targets that the European Union decides, and that then they could um, um, they enforce in all European Union. Um, still, member states are not always enforcing them, and then it then you will be you will have an infringement procedure. You will you will have uh, Europe saying you know you're not doing this well. But so maybe we could be a bit more strict on that. But but still, it has made great great help. And then of course, there's how you can also put criteria on the fund the money that comes from the European Union. Uh, it has been the case uh, in, in a certain number of, of uh, aspects. It is still much too weak, for example, for the Greens on the agricultural aspect. We still think that the targets are not at all there. That's why we are very upset with that policy, which is a huge aspect of the money coming from the European Union. On cohesion funds, we already have quite interesting criteria. And then, very uh, recently, we had this big decision about having special funds uh, in front of the pandemic and the crisis that that provoked. And these are the famous recovery funds. And on this, there was really an impulse from the European Parliament to put very strict criteria. Once again, the Greens will tell you these criteria are not enough, but they they were for the first time the European Union decided to <clears throat> put money together and be solidar to even um, take money from banks, which, which is quite in a, a big innovation, and put a very strict environmental criteria. So I think this is a very important aspect. And third, um, of course, it's also in all our trade agreements. Uh, every time we accept to, to bring to our countries very bad uh, uh, products that have been created, produced in very bad environmental uh, uh, standards, uh, then we weaken it weakened our, our role. So this is also, you know, if we are very strict in our trade agreements, this is also a way of acting. Mm -hmm. Ms. Brandner, where do you see, um, uh, which, which concrete measures uh, do you want uh, uh, to implement um, to bring an effective climate policy as quickly as science demands, demands um, on its way? I think there are you know, different ways you can go and you should use them at the same time. One is to invest heavily in new technologies and innovation for climate protection. And I think that is also important to keep the jobs because there will be a competition worldwide about who has the technologies of the future. So I think you know, if we don't manage to invest here now, we will lose the jobs tomorrow. Um, so I think the EU, as uh, Gwendolyn said, it's really important to invest in technologies, innovation for climate protection. And the second option is, and I hope the Commission will come forward with a strict proposal, it's on a circular economy. It's also the idea of recycling much more, of reusing rare earth in our cell phones, in cement, in how we do buildings. Um, so there's a lot we can do there. 
And the third one, which I find important is the question of pricing. How much, you know, what's the price of pollution? Um, and there also, I hope the commission will make an ambitious proposal. Um, so Peter, are there questions from the citizens? Yes, um, we do have a question. Like, give me a second. Uh, from um, Susi Trido, I think it's a video question. Um, so, can we bring her in? Hi. Ah, here she is. Hello, Susi. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm Susie from the exact. Uh, I come from France and I've got two questions for you tonight. Um, even if the Green Deal was launched, I would like to know if um, the opposition between um, climate protection and job losses still remains in certain sectors and the mentalities. And my second question is, uh, do you think that it would be possible to exploit uh, tax loopholes and the loss of incomes due to tax evasion, tax fraud, uh, to finance retraining and green job, uh, green job creation at re European level. Thank you. Thank you. So who wants to respond first? Shall I? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I also, by the way, wanted to say that sometimes if I turn my head, it's just because my daughter is coming in because it's home office um, <laughs> and you know, she sees me all day in front of the computer. So for her, it's like, if I want to talk to mommy, she's there. Um, and so please pardon her, um, if it seems like I'm looking outside of the, pic uh, of the screen. Um, to the question, um, you know, I think may many companies, and I would almost say most companies understood that if they do not adapt and go into the new technologies that they will then just disappear at one point and that this will be the biggest threat for jobs. Sometimes I have the impression that the companies themselves are further in thinking and even doing than some of their representatives on a federal or European level. The lobbyists sometimes are much more backward than the companies uh, on the ground. And that gives me a lot of hope that we will be able to get there faster than some think. Uh, and I'm always impressed when I see what's already happening, what kind of new technologies, you know, the solar screens on your window that you don't even see, uh, you know, like that you put on the fields, agro solar, um, you know, that you, you put it on up high so it even protects the apple trees from too much sun. So, you know, they're amazing of revolutions happening um, and we just have to roll them out. On the second question, yes, that's like a big issue to finally fight much more, con you know, tougher tax evasion and tax fraud within the EU. It's a tricky issue because it requires so far still unanimity and often the countries that do have tax havens like the Netherlands or Luxembourg, etc., they do oppose it. But we as Greens are fighting right now in the Netherlands for the national elections on a platform to close the tax haven in the Netherlands. So, you know, it's a fight we have to keep on fighting on several levels. And we think as Greens, and we suggest that we take that money or part of that and do finance um, the recovery fund, for example, because we will have to pay back that money and it's quite a bit. Um, and uh, so, yes, we use it for financing the transition. You, Francesca Brandner, do you want to respond, Caroline? Yes, very quickly. I mean, if there is <clears throat> there is still uh, in mentalities a symbolic uh, uh, gap between both in in cert, uh, for certain people. There is also a reality, uh, of course. Uh, these countries that are very, very uh, dependent on coal industry, they have to to go through a transition period, and we should help them, and they should be solidarity from one country to another country in this uh, situation. Um, as Francesca said, we also have a, a real problem today of, of sometimes the lobby here being stronger than the real economical sector that they, they represent. 
and, and all sorts of little entrepreneurs that are doing innovative things and would be uh, would accept to work in a very local way and, and uh, have local um, uh, um, stuff to work with, material, uh, they are not well represented here. So we do have this problem. Um, and then, of course, once again, the agricultural world is a very difficult one because we have uh, created these huge, extensive farms when little farmers are not living. Uh, and then on the own, we saw the, the, the question of um, the, the t where the money could come from. Indeed, it, there's tax evasion, as Francesca said, but there's also uh, how now we are thinking about having a price for these uh, attacks on these products that come from outside and that would just exactly uh, take into account the, the bad environmental externalities. Um, so this is a very important um, plan for the next years. All the recovery fund is founded on the fact that we are going to um, <clears throat> loan money from banks and we uh, hope to reimburse this money exactly like Francesca said by the by own resources. These own resources are taxes, so it would be a revolution, in fact, because um, after years where the European budget was only um, uh, coming from uh, member states' contribution for for the first time, one little part of the European budget would come from our own taxations. Thank you for, for that answer. Um, I have another uh, question from Sigbert Brandt uh, to both of you. Maybe you can ask quickly. And the question is, in which part of the EU do you see the most resistance to, green, to the Green Deal and the sustainable recovery idea and concept? How do you plan to convince them? What is your the way how you approach it? Because there are lots of resistances here and there. So how do you work with that? Well, clearly there's a big resistance um, in the East. Once again, there's a reality. There's a, the, we are facing, in some cases, economies that are so much dependent on fossil fuels and, and, and a very <clears throat> old uh, uh, economy uh, with, little, with cheap salaries and all of this, that there's a real reasoning for that. And there's also ideology. We still have in Eastern countries some um, governments that are in uh, climate denial. It still exists, sadly. So there's this mix of, of both. And then I would say that in all countries, we are in all member states, we are once again confronted to the same old resistance of <clears throat> some political uh, people that uh, still uh, do not want to take the the innovative and difficult decisions that have to be taken, so they will still go for the easy path, um, neglecting the fact that on the very long term they are putting people in danger. Um, and how do you resist to that? I mean, convincing, convincing and convincing. I don't know uh, a very big diff other methods in politics. You just then Today, we have the citizens helping us a lot because uh, citizens have shown so much that they cared about that politicians have to listen to it. But we still need, um, as Francesca really said, we have a problem with the lobbies in Brussels. So we really need also these lobbies to, to change. Thanks a lot. Maybe a quick answer from Francesca, Trenta. I try to be very brief. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, th there are countries that are still much more in fossil energies like Poland. And the exit from coal in Germany is very expensive um, and we can afford it. We as Greens believe it could have been cheaper, but whatever, it's still expensive. And I think it's fair enough to offer these countries help financially to make the transition. Um, and that's why we supported a Just Transition Fund, which is exactly helping regions to leave fossil um, fuels and old industries and transform to new ones so that we take all citizens with us and the employees so that they can train and get a new job. And second thing, that's not a money question, but it's a political question, for example, to convince farmers. We in Baden-Württemberg, that's my home state, you know, we had both sides. We had the, the people protecting the bees and climate and really saying you have to go on biodiversity. That's the, you know, the foundation of our life. And then you have farmers who say, but that's also our foundation and we do protect the environment as well and we're not the bad ones. And you know, then we brought them together 
and said we will only leave that table if we have a joint agreement on how we will make sure citizens have good food, healthy food, and how we can protect the climate and create biodiversity. And they came up with wonderful, really, solutions. Um, and I think that's the way forward. We have to sit together and not pinpoint and say, you're the bad one, you're the good one. But to say, you know, we need to do this together. It's our joint future. Um, and I think there's no other way than bringing people around a table and trying to work on compromises. Great. Thanks. Before we move to the other question, there is one other one that comes up very often when, it, when people talk about the Green Deal and the vision for, for um, projects in Europe, uh, very modern projects. And the question is, and please only two sentences, yeah, if possible. Um, what are the, the ideas of your party for the pan-European railway systems for the next 10 years? <laughs> um, we want speedy trains that go from, you know, Berlin to Prague, from Prague to Barcelona, and we want a lot of night trains. I'm working on a currently one on, from Barcelona to Frankfurt via Lyon. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes, that's it, night trains, and um, also uh, the, the, I don't know the word in English, so I'm so sorry. I mean, we need also the... Fred, the Fred, not just people, but like the... To go on trains and not in, in lorries. Yes. I have a question concerning this. Um, where are um, the resistances against these plans? Oh, I have been fighting for long, for example, for night trains. Peter knows that, uh, you know, <laughs> for years now. And there was always from the German transport ministers like, oh, we don't need this, it's old fashioned, you know, like uh, they are not uh, economically sound. It needs too much uh, uh, subvention, you know, like state subsidies. Um, so there was this always this argument, nobody wants to use these trains, Ms. Brandner, and they are not econ economically sound. And I always said, look, I know a lot of people and there are so many who want to use these trains, so please do put them back. I'm like, now he switched minds and he came along and said, okay, we do reinvest the night trains. But it was, these were the resistances in terms of we don't need them, they're too expensive. Mm. Yes, it, it's a very bad vicious circle. At one time, it looked very outdated to use trains. So we stopped um, feeding up, giving money. So the infrastructures became very bad. In France, that's the perfect example. So now we have to put so much money to get the trains back on lines that already exist, but have been left for eight years. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I think, Anya, we need to move to the other question. What do you think? There are no more questions concerning climate. Um, I'm just looking for the carbon tax here. So I um, ask another question uh, have... about climate, and um, this is Miss um, Brandner. Many people in Europe re rely on artificial intelligence to make rapid progress on climate protection. Others warn of more CO2 emissions through digitalization. What do you think? Will AI foster or hamper the Green New Deal? Uh, I think they will, there are many ways to make a, dig, a digital sector green. Um, and for example, it would be wonderful if we could say that all the big servers that need a lot of energy Mm -hmm. that they need to use green energy because that would uh, stimulate demand of green energy. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, it would be an advantage compared to other, you know, Americans, others, et cetera. We would be the standard setter for developing green tech. So I think there's not any opposition at all, but we need to make tech green and we need to use all the tech available to make the climate goals possible. Yeah. It's a long way to go. Um, Ms. Delvos uh, Caulfield, what do you think about it? Is AI? I, yes, I mean, I think um, new technology are going to help for, for sure, and we will need them uh, to adapt. Now, of course, um, new technology shouldn't be the new way of denying the climate situation. And this is often sometimes one of our big concern that people will jump on technology saying that we've got the solution. We don't have to change neither our habits, neither our way of consuming, of producing. 
and uh, the energy we consume. So of course we have to reduce energy, we have to change our way of producing, we have to be serious on all of this, and technology will be in help. And on the technology, the IA sector itself, I think Francesca said it, I mean, they, they, it is today not a very uh, friend, friend, ecological friendly sector and it has to become, and we need to have for them criteria too, to, yes, the storage places and all of this, they are very consuming energy for the moment, so we need to have solutions there too. Will you get a majority for this? How are the... Oh, intelligent, artificial intelligence is such a fashion in European Parliament. Everyone wants to work <laughs> on that. So when you say that, you know, we need to, okay, we need to, to use it, but also we need to put criteria on it. They, they, most of the time they accept, yes. This is topic where we manage to get things because they so much want to be into all these innovative tools. Okay, can you give us an example? It's interesting. An example of, of what, sorry? Um, how how we... fashionable it is? No, no, no. Um, uh, what um, uh, concrete measure you can you can push forward because it's um, uh, driven by uh, AI. I can give one. For example, the question when you turn on your wash machine, um, and you know that you, for example, if you rely on uh, renewable energies, the problems are the peaks that you sometimes have during the day, and at the peaks often go together with when there's no sun, etc. So you want to stretch it out over the day. And for that, you can use a lot of AI and then um, see when people use it, how you can fix it, etc. So there, but there is it's just one tiny example. Also how you use the cars, smart cars, etc. how they use much less, how they don't go into traffic jams, but how they go other way. So there are a billion examples of how you can use AI to, um, also in agriculture, by the way, you can use AI in terms of when the water, how much water, how much you need of everything. Um, you can make it much, you can improve the, and make it much more resource efficient. Thank you. We have another question, I think, Peter. Yes, we have another question, that's right. So when it comes to the Green Deal, some are talking about AI and faster trains and other have other views on it. Uh, we have one um, question that says, in Berlin, farmers are demonstrating in the streets um, often, every day. And from that, and also from the media, I got the impression those farmers got the feeling, the Green Deal, all the rules coming from Brussels are not good for him or for them. How does the EP Greens deal with that phenomenon? And how will they address the farmers who are concerned about their existence? Thank you. Um, well, I, oh. So I'm very sorry, I, I, I'm not aware of the very specific agricultural um, uh, I can situation that. in Germany. So yeah, I will let Francesca uh, uh, answer on that. What I would say about France is that the big trade union of the farmers, the one that is powerful and has a number of uh, established state places in a number of places where the farms are decided, they do not today represent the majority of the farmers in France. Majority of the farmers in France are little ones. They are, because of course, when you have a very extensive uh, domain, well, uh, you alone on a lot of, of, of ground, the, all the little ones, they are not represented. So I would always take with a bit of skepticism when there's a big fight from these big ones. Okay, thank you. On Germany, I already said something earlier on how we would like to solve it on bringing actors together. Um, and I think it's really a missed opportunity that this current government didn't do this um, because the farmers are under pressure. They have a very high price pressure mm. um, and, and they see anything that comes in addition as something they were like, we can't take it anymore. Um, and I, you know, I take that point serious and we have an interest in having, um, you know, our food grown here and, uh, and I think there is a way out. And I, and I believe that the big uh, unions, the farmer unions that Wendelin talked about, they have been telling them for years, if you continue going this way, you will be safe. But there is no salvation. It just makes their situation worse. We have more and more farms closing down, et cetera, because it's not affordable. So we are working for a new deal for agriculture, where we really make sure that they can have a good living on what they work, uh, what they produce, because, you know, it's ours. The substance on what we live um, and it also means for consumers to re-evaluate maybe for how much we do pay for our uh, food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I have another question from Rüdiger Schmidt uh, uh, to both, basically. And he says, how do you consider the so-called Kipppunkte, he didn't translate it into English, but I think you know, <laughs> uh, reported by scientists. It is a matter of only 10 years of or the like from now to change the world's behavior on using fossil fuels. Points of no return, hmm? something mm -hmm. like that. Francisca? Well, yes, I mean, it, it, that's I, for Francesca, like for me, I mean, it's the starting of our involvement in Greens policies, you know, uh, it, it sometimes would have been easier to go to a socialist or something like that. I mean, if we are in the Greens, it's not just because we, we thought it was fancy and, and, and all of this, it's because for a long, very long time we have uh, uh, considered that the situation is not only difficult, it is an emergency and, uh, and this is also why sometimes Greens um, will, will, will really not be happy with something because even if it seems to be a little step because we will say this is not a step enough. We are in such a situation that we need to take bigger steps. Thank you. So I think it's important to look at the role of science behind that question because you know the point of no returns etc that's scientific advice we get. And I think it's interesting to see how in a pandemic we do also rely on science. And I hope we can take a bit of this into the climate debate uh, and take it as serious when they tell us, you know, if you, do, if you go this way, some countries will just disappear. Spain will be a desert. You know, we should take it serious. I'm like, they are not stupid people. Um, and therefore, we, the next 10 years really will make the difference uh, in, the, you know, in climate change if we manage to do enough and fast enough. Thank you. So, um, last question. Um, it comes from Gerd Rosenberg and he says, what are the ideas of the Greens to establish a European champion on IA technology? Is this a goal or do you want to continue relying on the American providers? I can start on this one. You know, I think, um, we need, as Europeans, we need to keep the players we already have when it comes to the digital area and then invest and build up new ones and have corporations. On AI, I don't know if it will be one actor, but we have to invest there and make sure that we have also data provision for Europeans to come up with this and that we have big public data available and that we don't all need to rely on the data Google and others are collecting our private data. And I hope that the EU Commission will go this way and we need to provide these data because otherwise our citizens will rely on American technology. And these days when we talk about pandemics, I see with, uh, I'm quite scared to see how many American companies are moving into the digital health sector. Uh, and I hope we're not gonna be too late on this one already. Thank you. Yes, I mean, for sure, we need to uh, invest in our own technology, like we need to invest in our own vaccines and, and medical that we've been too many, too much dependent on others uh, in a number of top uh, domains. Uh, that being said, the, the reality we have today is indeed that we have to deal with these big providers. So already, I mean, our first uh, goal as Greens is to have them apply our rules, our data protection rules, our, um, our uh, uh, tax rules, because they, they avoid a lot our, our taxes, et cetera, et cetera, our, our salary rules and all of this. So, I mean, it's really for me, it's two a thread, thread at the same time. I mean, it, you cannot just uh, work on, on, on a future a uh, European provider, you have to tackle also the reality we have today here. And just on the, on the question just before, I just wanted to add a little thing is that um, I live in, the, when I don't live in Brussels, I live in the mountains in the Alps, I live at 1000 meter uh, between Grenoble and Chambéry. And uh, I can tell you that it's people are not, no, do not need any more science to know that it's happening. We don't have snow. We have been having winters without snow for a few years. This was not happening before. And, and in the mountains, like next to the sea, the people, they are seeing it exactly now. And I, and I thought about it because of what Francesca said about Spain. I, my friends in, in the south of Spain, they know already what it is to live with 50 degrees sometimes in the summer. 
One last question about solidarity and climate, um, because climate policy is about solidarity as well. Um, how do you want to prevent that member states with a CO2 intensive industry will be left behind and the populations of these countries? You know, as I mentioned earlier, I think we should support these countries or regions, really. It's often regions financially from the European level. And now we have, for example, the recovery fund, 750 billion that will be invested across Europe. And they have a link to climate change. And I really hope that the EU Commission will check that member states and regions do use the funds accordingly and properly. Um, so there should be 40% of that funding going into the transformation. Um, and that would really help many regions. And then there are additional tools like the Just Transition Fund, etc. So we have to support them and we have to make sure that, uh, and that was what Gwendolyn was saying earlier, that we make sure that we don't import dirty products that mm -hmm. are cheaper and then kick out the industry and the countries that still have to catch up. So, because that would be bad for the climate because it doesn't make, you know, it doesn't help the climate if it's produced terribly in China or any other country. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't help the climate and it uh, leads to job losses inside the EU. And I think that's something we really have to prevent from happening. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, uh, Ms. Delbos Caulfield, Ms. Brandner. Let's vote now about this question. Should the EU primarily promote sustainable innovation and jobs on a scale from zero to 10? How would you vote? Ms. Brandner. Oh, I'm at a high eight, nine. Okay. Ms. <laughs> Gwendolyn Davos. Yes, uh, the same. I would vote um, eight or nine. Uh, I, I, would, I would have the... The, the the demand of of adding the fact that mm -hmm. once again it's not just innovation that is going to save us we also need to change our habits thank you so let's move to the next um aspect discussed by our our home parliaments it's about social policy social inequality in the eu has been growing enormously since the financial crisis of 2007 social protection is very poor in some european countries in terms of minimum wages for example unemployment insurance or protection against poverty for retired people therefore we wanted to know should the eu invest more in social policy measures to tackle social inequality between the member states. Here, the home parliaments agreed least. The average score on the scale was 8.4. Almost half of the home parliaments would like to see the EU move from an economic union to a social union, but almost as many do not think this is realistic because of the different social security systems, cultures, and economic situations. Others considered social policy as a task of the national states anyway. So first call for questions again, dear citizens, if you have questions concerning this point, please note them now in the Q&A section. So Ms. Delwald Caulfield, there are huge differences between the social security systems in Europe, even between Germany and France. Um, in your perspective, does a common European social policy make sense from the French point of view? And what would be the first step towards a social So now that I'm a member of the European Parliament, I try to think in a European point of view rather than okay. the French one. Um, <laughs> but in both cases, I think it does make sense. Um, and I understand these people that think that it's not realistic because maybe they imagine that that would mean tomorrow uh, having all our system merged and, um, and, and having everywhere the same money, the same subsidies, uh, uh, minimum wages, secure, social mm -hmm. security and all this right. coming from the same organ structure. This is not how it's going to work. It's a long uh, path. It's a long process for the moment. Social uh, is indeed member states uh, competence. Europe has got a very little competence on that. 
But so the first step is to coordinate things. Um, you have already people that are dealing with the problems, having that challenge. If you are a border worker, if you have someone that have been living in a different European countries in different moments, these people, the students, all of these people, they already know the problem and we already are looking there are already some solutions um, existing and, and in Parliament and in European Union, people are already working to, to, to answer these problems, have solution for the border workers, how you can take your unemployment benefits from one country to another country, social security, how you can have social security in the country where you go. So this already exists and we need to, to gradually step uh, do step after step to coordinate things even more. Uh, we need to think about minimum wages. We need to think about a way for poor people to have a solution everywhere in Europe. And then it will take ages before it becomes this very unified thing. If, I mean, if European Union still exists in 50 years, maybe then we will have this European system. Uh, but we're far from there for the moment. But what is realistic is to do coordination, to do more and more steps. This is really realistic. It's possible. People are already working on it. Uh, and of course, we should do it because being an economic union with not being a social union is just putting us uh, in a competitive situation, one against the other. It's, it's in fact a very bad solution what we're living at the moment. Yeah, that's exactly what uh, the political scientist Ulrike Gero criticizes uh, 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 in the EU that as a single market with a free movement for workers and service providers um, would never work anyway in the long term without a common social stan standards. Um, for you, Ms. Brandner, what would be um, the next step? I mean, uh, a concrete measure that you um, think to be very realistic to be realized in Europe. Next. There is one thing that is already in the Rome treaties that has still not yet been implemented across the EU, and it's the uh, equal pay between women and men. Uh, and it has been enshrined in the treaties, uh, not just equal pay for equal work, for even for gleichwertige Arbeit, for equal valued work. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that would be a big advance if finally the Commission would come up with a legislative proposal on how we can implement this better. There are wonderful examples on how you can do this. I'm happy to go into detail, but this is one thing. We need to fulfill mm -hmm. this promise of the treaties. Thank you. Peter, do we have any questions from the citizens? Yes, uh, we do have one from Walter Janssen. And he says, in my opinion, there must be a social deal the same way that there is a great deal, but also for social equality. It is not necessary to have a plan for 30 years to have same minimum wage, same pension, same social security system. Would it uh, not be possible for the EP to set up such a plan, or does it exist? Who wants to start? Gwendolyn? Or? Yes, I mean, uh, of course I would love to, but once again, I mean, since, since the beginning, a certain number of environmental rules and aspects are European competence. Social has never ex been accepted by the member states like be, to be a, a European competence, uh, like education and a number of things. The member states are very, very uh, protective of their privileges in these topics. And once again, you cannot say that it's so easy because to be honest, our systems are very different. The French system that I love personally is a very, very public state uh, uh, paid system. Uh, a lot of system in the Nordic systems are a mix between private and public. So no, it, it's not like that that you can harmonize them. Um, so of course, uh, uh, some groups uh, on the left, basically of the of the political landscape, say that Europe should have more social competences. The Greens are part of these groups, um, and we can hope that we will go there. Um, and, and once again, there are things that we can already do. Uh, Francesca tackled it. Uh, it's in, also in the question you've, of, of this person. Indeed, at least uh, having rules that all the member states have to enforce on the fact that you cannot pay less someone because she's a woman, someone because he's a LGBTI person, someone because he's not of the good color, of the good religion and all this is already a fight. And on this, we do have 
a, a leverage and we could do things. And they are directives that are not enforced enough. So that's the first thing. And on security things, once again, we can already have a, a certain number of rules for all these people that go from one country to another country. These are the first steps and we have to fight for the others, for sure. Yeah. So would it make sense to harmonize much more than it is today, the systems from your point of view? It's not about harmonization in terms of making everything equal. So the idea is not to say there is a minimum salary of whatever, 10 euros across the entire EU, because that's totally unrealistic and wouldn't make sense. Um, but to say that you need a basic a minimum salary that allows you to live beyond the, uh, you know, the level of poverty in each member state, mm -hmm. and that could then diversify also the way how you define it. In Germany, it's, um, you know, it's not the government that sets it, but it's also with the unions, with, you know, it's a complicated process, but we would like to keep that process. So it doesn't, and in France, it's defined in a different way. So you keep your system how you define it. We keep our system, mm -hmm. but we do agree together that we want to have a basic income, uh, sorry, a minimum salary that allows you to be out of poverty so that if you work, you don't have to go into poverty. And I think that's what we aim for. It's not harmonization in terms of making it equal, but to guarantee the same rights. Um, and I think in the second one to the question of, you know, what kind of plan you make. For me, tax justice is very important that we make sure that everybody really is paying taxes inside the EU and that you can't go to Ireland or the Netherlands and then you pay less. And then we have less as a state to give and invest in Green Deal or other issues. So I think for me, that's also a key priority when we talk about social justice. Um, and there are good examples now how we have advanced fast on social, for example, in the crisis with SURE, it's an unemployment scheme where we do support the unemployment systems in member states when they come under stress. And that's, I think, a big step ahead. <clears throat> are there more questions from the citizens? There, there are more. Uh, there's one from Martin Contact, and it, it also relates to the differences between the European economies. Um, and he says, um, wouldn't it be good in, in a sense of a more reasonable social policy that Germany reduces the trade surpluses in Europe so that there is more balance in this in order to, to allow for stronger economical convergence? Um, among the European countries that would allow at least to have more harmonization indirectly. Yeah? I'm not sure I understood. What would lead to that harmonization? Uh, it's it's, it's the fact that I understood that it's the fact that the German economy is, is based a lot on the fact of selling its product to the other European exactly. uh, countries. Yes, I mean, this is something where... Uh, uh, it's it's a difficulty for European Union because this the German um, economy is really constructed in this way, um, and I want on this to to really honor the German Greens because they were one of the first uh, people coming from German, you know, having the courage uh, when it was the the famous financial crisis to say, you know, okay, Greece probably did make some mistakes and, and all of this is complicated, but we also should take our responsibility. So indeed, this is the idea of solidarity. We have economies that are based on, on different ways of producing. We, we have economies that are only around tourism, for example, a lot in the south, uh, around fossil fuels in the east. We have economies that are uh, selling a lot to the other Europeans like Germany, and but they're not the only one. We have a lot of um, lo big, big, big state uh, enterprises in France that are sometimes uh, monopoles. So we have to deal with the, the, the weakness and the strength of every economy. And, and the important thing is that people stop thinking uh, in a nationalistic way and accept to think, oh, uh, you know, uh, it's also in my interest, in my future interest, because of course, if tomorrow all the European member states were to be too poor to buy German products, very good German products, to, uh, who were, the German economy was clever enough to, you know, to, to, uh, to challenge itself and do quality products. So, but indeed, if we cannot pay them anymore, then Germany will not either benefit from it. So it's, it's this that we need to put every one in, in front of its responsibility and think that economy will only function if we think it in a European way. Right. 
Thank you. Thank you. One last question from the home parliamentarians uh, in general. Um, some of them considered uh, common uh, EU social policy simply to be too expensive. What do you think, Ms. Brandner? You mean the social policies like the European Social Fund or which uh, policy? No, social um, security system, I think. No, like none of us wants to have a European wide uh, minimum income scheme uh, or where you have one system of health and, you know, insurance, etc. The idea is rather to say that we set minimum standards in each member state and that if the system gets under stress, for example, an unemployment scheme because you get into big crisis, mm -hmm. that then you can make loans to support your unemployment you're unemployed through the crisis and then pay it back later so that you don't go even deeper into the crisis. Um, so these are the ideas that we defend um, uh, because otherwise you would need huge taxation at the European level uh, and we're very far from this. Uh, we would be happy if we may manage to close the tax loopholes, make sure everybody's paying taxes, um, having you know a good CO2 tax and then use that to invest in a transformation and support the social, you know, like the education, et cetera, that is needed new training for making this possible. Okay, thank you. So let's come um, to the last point, our voting, Ms. Delbus Caulfield, Ms. Brandner, let's vote. Should the EU invest more in social policy measures to reduce social inequality in the EU on a scale from zero to 10, how would you vote? Devils Caulfield. Well, there again, I mean, I would I would put a high uh, number, <laughs> um, maybe uh, seven because of all these complexities. But it's not only a matter of investment; it's more a matter of obligations in every member state. We must not have member states still accepting to pay very low wages uh, or, or pay for the hour, like it existed in an ex-member state now, which England, which bring, brought back a few years ago the job per the hour. This is incredible for a French person. So that sort of thing, We all that's, that's the first goal, having obligation in every member state for good conditions. Okay, Ms. Brandner? Yeah, for me, it's uh, up very high. It's, you know, really eight. Um, and it's not about harmonization in terms of making us all equal, but making sure that some actors cannot misuse and abuse open borders that we have within the EU. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So let's have a look at the last aspect discussed in our home parliaments, economic support in a crisis. EU member states have been affected um, in, a different, in different ways by crises such as the corona pandemic, and they have varying degrees of ability to find a way out of the crisis on their own. We therefore asked the home parliaments, should wealthy EU member states provide more economic support to member states that are particularly hard hit by crisis? The answer was a clear yes. On a scale from zero to 10, strongly agree, home parliaments voted on average a 7.4. They expect more European cohesion and trust from, uh, from economic support in a crisis. And they are convinced that everyone, everyone benefits from financial support because Europe remains economically efficient. But one thing was striking. Many home parliamentarians demand to tie economic support to certain conditions, such as specific measures for regional industrial promotion or to the principles of the rule of law. Those who trample on the rule of law in their own country should not receive any money from the EU. Call for questions, dear citizens. If you have any questions concerning this point, let's begin with the condition rule of law. Please note them now in the Q&A section. Yes, we had a lot of discussions last year about the rule of law. Um, this was a topic of conflict in the EU. Hungary and Poland rejected the rule of law mechanism and blocked the EU budget. At the end of 2020, a compromise was reached, a supplementary declaration was, was developed that 
now softens the application, not the mechanism itself, of the rule, rule of law. So, Ms. Brandner, one of your main topics I've read are fundamental values and the principle of um, the rule of law. In your opinion, how far should or must the EU go to enforce the rule of law, even if member states like Hungary or Poland threaten to leave? I think we must be very firm and must go very far in this because it's the basis of our being together and working together. And I also, you know, sometimes Hungarians say, why do you care about, you know, what structure we have in Hungary? And I say, because your government is taking decisions and that affect my life. You are sitting in the council um, and there you have your voting rights. And I want to make sure that the way you are elected or how you are in power is in a democratic way and that in your country the rule of law is respected. Um, and I want to be sure that I live in a community where values and human rights and democracy rule of law are respected. Um, so for me it's a very, very important step that the EU should be much more critical. I think the EU Commission must become much more you know, strict. There are examples, for example, where now in Hungary, um, how the Erasmus Plus money is spent is not acceptable, where they do exclude organizations from receiving funds based on a law which has been mm -hmm. entitled as non-legal with EU treaties by the European Court of Justice. And, you know, I think there are many things where the EU Commission already today, without changing any legal context, could be much stricter and tougher could you give us an, another example that was a good one? Maybe you have other examples which concrete measures. Yeah, there is the other one when you have, uh, you know, when in some Polish areas they do declare themselves as LGBTQI free zones. Uh, and then, you know, why do we give funding to these governments if they do breach so strongly our joint values? Um, or if you do finance, um, research systems, uh, and then they do not allow a diversity of views in their programs. So there are many examples where already today we have very clear rules. Um, it's not, we don't need anything in addition. We just need bravery from the European Commission and member states. And for example, what we in Germany don't use, um, if the commission goes uh, um, like a treaty a breach um, procedure, member states can join like some Scandinavian, Scandinavian countries have joined uh, in, in, you know, vis -a -vis Poland, etc. Germany has only done this for economic reasons, never for the rule of law and democracy. So, you know, there are many things we can still do without changing anything. And in the long term, I really wish that we could make the wonderful Carter of fundamental rights the EU has, which is such a wonderful document. It is so modern and so, so great to make this really applicable to all national laws and to make sure every European citizen has the rights enshrined in, the, in this Carter. Thank you. Are there any um, questions from the citizens, Peter? Yes, there are some. Um, one is rather an institutional question um, to become more effective when it comes to making decisions. And Kerstin is asking, um, is there a way to overcome the autonomously voting in the European Council and introduce a two-thirds majority voting system, for example? Because obviously, rule of law can only be achieved when there are not one, two countries who always oppose this. So I think that's, a, that's an interesting question. Who wants to start first? Well, in general, of course, the, there's a number of decisions in Council that can only be taken um, with unanimity, this is the worst system possible uh, because indeed one member state can block everything on rule of law aspects. Um, um, so I, I am the rapporteur of the parliament for the Hungarian situation, so I know it very, very well. And I know, of course, also about the Polish situation and, and, and I'm very involved in all the rule of law aspects in, in parliament. So I know all of this very well. And I can tell you that exactly as Francesca said, there are already so many things that could be done with no institutional changes. I am not saying that I do not want institutional changes. I consider myself as a federalist. I think we should go for much more integration in a number of topics, 
and uh, I think that the two, that uh, the the reinforced majority and even worse unanimity is very blocking on a number of topics. But even without institutional changes, today what we are lacking the most is courage. It's not institutional at the moment. We are lacking courage. We are lacking mm -hmm. courage from the Commission. We are lacking courage from the member states. Um, they are not doing what is to be done. Uh, there are awful pushbacks at the borders of Hungary. They, there was a time where they would starve people, migrants in places. Um, there, there, there is all these attacks against NGOs. They are concentration media. So there we are in full European competency. We have fair competition. It's, it's, it's the basis of European Union, the market, protection of the market. There is no more true competition between big medias in, in, um, in Hungary because it's all being paid by the state and they decide who can have uh, broadcasting uh, uh, emission on for radios and they decide who gets the state advertisement and all this. And all of this is bluntly known. It's documented in council, like in commission, you have advisors that work all day about this and they know all about this and people have notes full of notes and then you just need people to act on it and this is yeah. uh, today our worst problem so it's ra it's rather courage not so much the institutional thing you're, no, you're no, saying and, of course and institutional would help because if yeah. they were not so afraid that hungary would, could block things they would have a bit more courage oh. but then it's also the fact that you know it's difficult to judge your pair it's difficult for a member state to judge another member state. It's also that then you have economical links, diplomatical links. All of this uh, gives a lot of reasons to member states to not dare, uh, you know, uh, uh, say things uh, or, and even more act. We, we've passed the stage of awareness. For a long time, there was even denial. It, it took a long time before member states accepted that what was happening in Hungary and Poland was problematic. Um, we've reached the stage of talking. We, we see more and more governments saying strong, harsh things, but now we need the stage of acting. Mm -hmm. And that, I have one question that prolongs a little bit. This one that is um, saying, why is the commission not being strict um, and what do you think are the possible reasons that the Commission is not sufficiently strict concerning the violation of rule of law? Why is that the case? Is it? Correct? I have difficulties to answer this. No, I mean, um, um, no, it's difficult to understand. In these last months, we really had a problem. So we come back to your initial um, presentation of the rule of law mechanism, the, this conditionality idea. Um, that people want to, to see enforced. And I, I just wanted to say uh, about that, that even in Hungary and Poland, when you do surveys, people in Hungary and Poland understand that the European money should be conditioned to rule of law. So they're not against the principle. Um, anyway, so where, because we needed unanimity and we needed them to vote for it, we, get, we, give, we gave them a huge leverage and we were hostage of that. So for one year, we've been in this situation where nobody did anything more. People were stopping everything about Hungary and Poland because of that. Now we need the Hungarian government to still do one step, which is the ratification of a, of a technical thing about these famous own resources. After that, we can hope that maybe action will come a bit more. Uh, but there's also a part of mystery. Um, can me. I maybe answer that? Because I think, you know, um, part of the problem is that the party of Orban, Fidesz, is still a member of the European People Party, the Conservative Party family. And I think, you know, that as long as they're part of the family and are still accepted, um, there are, you know, there are barriers why you don't go further. And I think that it's really high time that the European People's Parties would and uh, not just put their membership on hold, but really um, send them the way out um, where they do belong to. And the second point, I, you know, in terms of institutional changes, even on the budget and the recovery fund, the 25, 26 could have gone alone without Hungary. And I think, you know, it was way too late that the European 
Commission put out proposals for a plan B of saying, dear Mr. Orban, if you don't want the German taxpayers' money and the French taxpayers' money, nobody obliges you to take that money, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and we go alone, and then you watch where you're going to be, and you tell your citizens that you don't want the money because um, you don't want to oblige, be obliged to accept the rule of law. So this is really a question of courage, of showing alternatives, um, and really making sure that uh, you are clear there. Uh, and so I think, you know, institutionally, we do have to improve and getting to qualified majority voting on social and tax, tax issues. But there's always the way to go ahead with a few. You only need to be seven. It's not so many. Mm -hmm. And then you can do a lot. And I think we need to be much more forceful on this and saying, you know what, okay. And we need to do this on migration because I find it unacceptable that we do tolerate the situation in our, on our borders and probably will never get an answer at the level of 27. Um, so let's start with a few and then see who will join. So you are convinced that you can change it from within the EU, the system, so that that rule of law can be achieved in a much better way. So that means you see it in a different way. Just recently, there was a discussion between Katharina Bali and Sven Simon and Daniel Kohn Bendit uh, and Daniel Freund. And I remember that Daniel Kohn Bendit was saying it's not possible within the EU to change it. You have to reinvent the EU with a coalition of the willing mem member states. So you are much more optimistic. I'm still optimistic that there's room for going ahead with a few. And, you know, in the end, it will be the Hungarians who decide about their future. And all we can do is to, for example, the EPP, you know, take that label away that he's part of the conservative family. That's our responsibility. And we have to make sure we do every step that we can do. And yes, in the end, it is their choice. Um, but we can support it. We can make sure that we at least keep to the rules. And I think, yes, there are still many options within the EU if we only want to use them. Okay, thank well, you, Anna. Um, uh, let's come uh, in the end um, to the economic conditions. Uh, we did already talk about this. Um, Ms. Devils Crawford, in your view, does it make sense to link financial support to concrete measures? Um, and what possibilities and obstacles do you see for this in political practice? because um, this is what uh, was discussed um, in the home parliaments. You are talking about rule of law uh, conditionality? No, 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 the economic conditions. Uh, many home um, parliaments wanted um, to uh, demand to tie economic support to certain conditions such as uh, specific measures for regional industrial promotion. And um, so that the economy can develop in a, uh, in a certain way. Is it, uh, uh, is it a good thing? Yeah, to... I'm not sure. I, it's very clear for me. I'm not a very big specialist of these questions. I mean, as I said, I think for us, the most important is to have um, uh, environmental condition. Um, that's, that was really the... the, the, the um, fundamental fight that we had on the recovery fund and, and we try to have it on cohesion fund also to say, you know, uh, now you mustn't have uh, subsidies going for things that harm the planet, harm uh, biodiversity, harm climate and all of this. Um, so about economical conditions, I'm not very much aware. The idea is, of course, that, you know, we don't want uh, in a very theoretical way, I'm going to answer, is that you don't want to have uh, some parts of Europe that are only, um, that are not producing anything and only uh, relying on tourism or agriculture or, mm -hmm. or, you know, or are only having their workers working in other places. For example, the problem we are facing a lot in Eastern countries is that uh, a lot of Eastern people are going to work in, in Germany, Austria, um, and they do not work in their own land. Um, so that's the sort of problems that we, we want to tackle. Uh, I, I, I don't know about more specific request, uh, demands of the Greens on this. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, maybe I can just say, you know, if we do spend money together and even if we go into debt together to invest, we of course need to set joint rules for what the money is going to be spent and how it's going to be spent. Mm -hmm. You can call this a joint economic policy or joint economic mm -hmm. rules. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm like, it would be completely unacceptable to do it in a member state mm -hmm. and not acceptable to do it at the European level. 
Um, and the German government, for example, has pushed now for the recovery fund for it to be linked to the European semester, mm -hmm. uh, which do proposes reforms. And now we see, unfortunately, that the German government is not really keeping that up itself. <laughs> you know, and that's where the problem comes, that if you tell others to do what, you know, and then you don't do it yourself, then it becomes completely screwed in the EU. And then you create bad feelings in Italy and other countries. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's where we have to be. As Germans, I feel that responsibility that whenever we set up rules, we have to obey to them too. Uh, and sometimes then maybe would put out different rules. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, there was one comment and I maybe I wasn't clear in what I said about Hungarian citizens. I think it's amazing to see how brave they are and how much they're fighting and that we should really do everything to support them. And the same is true for Poland when I see the women and the men striking now for their rights. Um, if it wasn't for Corona, I would be there and support them because, you know, I think really um, they're so brave and courageous and we need to support them. So thank you. Um, do we have any more uh, questions from the citizens? Because um, time is over nearly, but we haven't got a question concerning the economic conditions. I don't think so that we have. No, I think we should move over to the next one. Okay, so um, Ms. Devils Crawford, Ms. Brandner, let's vote. Should the EU provide economic support to member states, particularly, uh, particularly affected by crisis? On a scale from zero to 10, how would you vote? Ms. Brandner? Yeah, it's same also high up there. Same also. <laughs> I, okay. It's important. And you, Ms. Dallas Coffield, as well? V very high, nine. I mean, that's the purpose of European Union, you know, work as a global territory and help each other. Okay. So, thank you. It's um, time to uh, let's take stock. The general vote of the home parliaments was simply clear. 97% uh, want more, more solidarity in Europe in general. In your opinion, is Europe ready to make the leap from an economic community to a true social community? Mentalities are changing a bit. We saw this on the recovery fund. Um, Francesca would explain this better, but I was already in the European Greens at the time of the financial crisis and how Greece was so badly hurt and how um, the member states just, you know, didn't want to 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 take no acknowledge that and and made the Greek people suffer. Um, and uh, at the time, it was um, nearly impossible to get um, a, a European feeling of we need to to be in this together. There was mostly reproaches to Greece, and you know, while well, you're in this situation, you got into a financial devast devastating problem. But now you know, we're not going to make any effort and we only had austerity as an answer. Um, this was a very difficult moment for European Union. A lot of citizens after that, mostly in the South, started doubting about European Union. We saw in this pandemic a very different uh, approach of, of citizens, uh, of the head of governments uh, in the council, of the people in parliament, the members, the members of parliament in commission, it, it was very clear, the, the change of approach. Uh, and at the time when, when there was this different approach, it was not even all the member states that were really in a problem. It was Italy, Spain, so uh, you could have had the same attitude coming from the same member states of, of the north or, or, or around Germany saying, you know, it's not our problem. Um, so there is this change. Um, it's not yet translating in so many actions. So are we ready or not? I, 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 we're in the middle of the, of the bridge, I would say. Uh, we did manage to get this recovery plan uh, installed. We did manage to get uh, member states uh, accept the idea that there will be some money um, uh, lended by the banks to help everyone in a general way. Uh, so this is quite a step because it's a cultural really difference that uh, for a long time a lot of member states did not want to accept the idea that European Union would take money from the banks. Um, so there we are, but we still need a lot to go to a real social community. Mm. 
Ms. Brandner, do you think that we'll have a, a real social community in 10 years? You know, I hope that we move towards more justice uh, and equality uh, and that we make the basis for this within the EU. And I don't, you know, I, I think we must be a climate union, a social union, an economic a values union. So I'm not, you know, we are the European Union and then we must make sure that it's fair, uh, it's based on the rule of law and democracy and that we make the necessary trans transformation to protect the pl planet. So I wouldn't want to call it one union or the other, but you know, this is one and then we have joint goals and rights and values that we need to protect. Okay, thank you very much to you both. Um, it was a, was a very lively and interesting dialogue. Um, and I think it fits well with a general um, development in Europe. New participation formats for citizens are emerging everywhere, in Ireland, in France, um, uh, and in Germany mid-January, the Citizens' Council uh, here has started. The EU itself is planning a conference for the future of Europe. Um, what does it mean, this was my last question for you as a politician, that citizens all over Europe are demanding more participation and formats like this are increasing? Ms. Brandner. I think it's wonderful. Uh, again, I refer to my home state, Baden-Württemberg. We have had a great uh, citizens dialogue on Europe. Um, and I've learned a lot from this and taken a lot from it. And I know that there have been projects and ideas evolving there mm -hmm. that have been picking up uh, at different levels. So I think, you know, yes, we need more transparency. We need more involvement. Um, and I still, you know, I'm conf really confident that if citizens do defend the EU, uh, we will be able to keep it. And, you know, for me, the EU is like democracy. It's not perfect. It will never be, but all alternatives are so much worse. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, in that spirit, I think you, we need citizens engagement to make it better, knowing full well that it won't be perfect, uh, but it's a daily struggle to defend it and to make it better. Mm -hmm. Mr. Elbow Scorfield does uh, do so many different participation formats for citizens make your daily job as a politician more complicated or easier? Wow, much easier. I mean, if, if, <laughs> if all European citizens were interested in Europe, it, it would make our life much easier. Um, it's the country we really need it and we, we, need, we need it for the future of Europe. I mean, it's urgent. I think it's what you're doing is very important, very, very important, not just a bit. Um, uh, indeed, for this conference of, of the future of Europe, we have asked uh, the Council uh, and, and the Commission to really take inspiration from the, the, the climate convention in France, what uh, citizen assemblies that exist in Baden-Württemberg, what happened in Ireland around the referendum and other topics, um, because this is not only um, uh, making politics hear the citizens and we need to hear them, it's not only bringing new dynamics, new energy, but it's just, just reinforcing the European citizenship. Um, today, this is for me our, our biggest challenge. Do people feel European? Is, does this European citizenship exist really? How do we deal with it on all topics? Rule of law. I mean, today, one of my fundamental arguments when I'm very angry with the Council and the Commission is to say, you are not treating the Hungarian citizens and Polish citizens equally to the others. You're accepting that they live in deteriorated situation of rule of law and you find it normal you know, you should have standards of what is a European citizenship. Today, you can buy European citizenship in some member states with golden visa. This is, this is appalling, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is really important. We need people to get involved. We need them to reclaim a future and to say, you know, we, we belong to this European Union and we don't want you to make stupid things with it. So it's, it's not just important, it's essential. Um, it creates a European feeling. So I really hope they will exist and you need to shout because council is not wanting to put you there. They, they accept to work with national parliaments. They accept to work with even sometimes regional parliaments, but they don't want national assemblies. So you need to reclaim this. 
Okay, we, we're going to try it as hard as we can. <laughs> we promise. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Brandner and Ms. Devil's Caulfield, for this uh, lively and exciting uh, discussion. And thank you for taking so much time. It was, was really a pleasure to have you here. And thank you also to all uh, the participants who have taken part in the debate tonight. Yes, and thank you also uh, for this active discussion tonight. Um, it reminds me a little bit of what Carmela Harris just recently said, quoting John Lewis, um, who said, democracy is not a state, it's an act. And it's great to see you acting all together, citizens and politicians. And of course, we couldn't answer all the questions today. I'm sure if you send the questions to the politicians, they will answer. Um, and we will continue organizing more discussions around these really hot topics, solidarity, rule of law, and so on. So we will have in future further opportunities to talk. And the next discussion with uh, European politicians will take place on February 16 at 7 p.m. The guests will be two representatives of the lefts in the European Parliament, Martin Schirdewan and Helmut Scholz both from Germany. Our last webinar will be therefore in German. And don't forget, in spring 2021, that's almost now, the fourth round of uh, European Home Parliaments will start again. Join in, become a host, turn your kitchen table into a little Europe. We will keep you posted on Twitter, Facebook, and on our website. And if you want to learn more about what's happening, just go to Home Parliaments AU. For tonight, we say goodbye, au revoir, tschüss, dear Europeans. Uh, thank you for joining us. Merci. 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 Merci.